Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the uh, nine game main slate uh, that we have here on Thursday. Um, mostly day baseball today, just a couple of late afternoon games. Uh, one started here at uh, 4 Eastern, and I believe that might be the latest. No, there's one more game after that starting at 6 Eastern, uh, and then nothing tonight. So kind of surprising that we don't have anything, even on a a Thursday. Um, but that's it. So we won't have anything for, at least I won't have anything for, the uh, Toronto and Boston game with Gosman and Brian Bayo on the mound. Um, kind of unfortunate that the schedule is spread out a little bit. We would probably like to play a little bit of Gosman there. Um, Brian Bayo's got some upside, but man, we'd also probably like to play some Toronto in that in that game as well. So maybe a maybe a fun showdown sort of gamble punt if you are interested in such things. Um, so we're going to go over the, the nine game main, as we said. Um, and since it's a pretty early start, I'm going to once again try and keep this under an hour, but uh, we'll probably fail. Uh, we are getting Verlander back today. He is up at 10-8. Um, so we're going to have to make some decisions there. Of course, we have the Coors slate, right, with Milwaukee and Colorado. Uh, Wade Miley on the mound for the Brewers. And Connor Siebold making a spot start for the Rockies. Uh, they're missing a lot of guys in their rotation. Uh, Herman Marquez is going to – he has to, has, has to have TJ now. So um, it, they also lost Noah Davis with some elbow inflammation. And they're they're kind of struggling here a little bit. Um, even though Kyle Freeland last night took apart the Brewers pretty good, uh, I think we might be able to once again go back to Milwaukee today. And they're they're coming in with heavy heavy ownership again, similar to those those Cardinals slates that we had at Coors Field earlier in the season. Um, we're gonna see the same kind of ownership on Milwaukee today, so we got to be aware of that. But we've got some other pitching arms. I think we can. Uh, that we can consider um, outside of that. So enough with the dilly-dallying. Uh, let's just get into it. We do have projections and initial ownerships loaded. However, I would caveat these once again with a disclaimer. A uh, couple spots don't have Tyon or Verlander numbers up just yet. And as you see here with this unannounced flashing red box uh dk actually doesn't have dylan dodd in the player pool for some ridiculous reason guys had two starts in the bigs this year and they he goes down to the minors and dk just removes him from the pool so not sure what's going on over there but um frustrating that dk does this with a lot of freaking guys in any case let's uh let's just get into the games here and um you know keep an eye out for the projection updates over the next couple hours we'll be pushing updates uh, as soon as we get them. So let's just get into it. First game on the docket is Cubs and Washington. Uh, Jamison Ty on, on the mound for the Cubs. He's coming back from a groin injury, so it's not like a, an arm or, or anything like that. Uh, he's only been on the shelf for the minimum 15 days here. So I think it's a playable price tag here at 7700 for Tyon. Um, median projection, not great, as it really isn't anymore, kind of ever, uh, for Tyon. He his stuff isn't all that impressive. He's just a pitcher at this point in his career. Uh, higher upside, but he had to take, whatever, a, a couple of years off. Uh, one full year, at least, with um, with the cancer. And and he's dealt with some, I mean, various injuries over his career. So never really realized the, the true upside, I guess, that was projected for him, mostly just due to getting hurt. And anymore, just a pitcher. 21% aggregate K rate, still giving up a little bit of power and some hard contact. Nothing terribly worrisome there, but elevated for sure. 177 ISO to the right side, that's attackable, and 182 to the left side, also attackable. And so that's kind of why we're seeing a, a low median projection on him so far. Low ownership, but I think this this is a playable price because the Nats are bad. Um, we can really go after them with pretty much anybody. They're hard to realize a lot of strikeout upside against, of course. Just a 19.5% aggregate K rate against righties this year. And they're pushing 800 PAs so far. So this number is well enough converged 
73 WRC plus though with an 089 ISO. It's going down uh, over the last couple of days. So still not hitting for power. Um, still no hard contact. Still a a lot of ground balls, and this number is actually going up. So um, I think we can still get to some tie on here. He's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, but with a, a lack of real power in the lineup for the Nats, they're really not all that scary. You can get to some guys, um, and you can stack some of their kind of speed and, and upside lefties, if you want to call them upside lefties. Uh, I think that's fine. Like a Luis Garcia, he's still very cheap, 26 in the two-hole, going to pop again in projections as he has for the last you know, couple of weeks, really. Jamer at 3,000, I think this is a playable spot. Um starting to warm up a little bit in Washington. The ballpark plays up power and and scoring a little bit more when, when the weather gets warm there. So, I mean, it's not 95 degrees that we'll see in the next couple of months, but uh, 65 degrees, it's, uh, it's nothing to, I mean, it's not 40 like we saw in Minnesota or something. Uh, Dom Smith at 2,100, still playable. Um, not super thrilling, but playable, definitely. Joey Manessis down here at 31, also playable. Hard to get to uh, Kavert Ruiz behind the plate sometimes because he just doesn't hit for any power. He's got like an 090 ISO himself, uh, but he is a cheap three-hole catcher at uh, 2,900, so that's it's playable. So you can get to some Nationals once again. Um, you're not going to get leverage on the field by stacking against Tyon, so that's kind of the downside there. Well, also the downside is, well, the Nats are bad. But uh, you can play some of these guys, and, you know, they – each of them have 15 point upside and and 20 point upside. It's not um, that's workable as a secondary stack in tournaments. Um, I think I would overall probably side with Tyon. I think the price tag here is a little bit more playable than trying to get to Nat stacks on on a full nine games. Plenty of other offensive spots we'd rather get to certainly. Um, so I think I'd side with Tyon. But I'm not overly jacked about this going after the Nats uh, with a pretty low upside strikeout arm as it is. Arsenal's really just break even top to bottom. Good curveball, but uh, outside of that, like you can't work off of a curveball, right? You you can work off of a changeup in terms of like a secondary pitch that you can you can really establish with. But his changeup is bad, and it's always been kind of bad. So um, he can't really do that with a curveball. And he's only throwing at 15% of the arsenal here as well. So he, he spreads it out with a good six pitches um, here with the 3x fastball mix, bad change, and the slider curve combination. You know, so I think this is a, a suppression spot for Tyon. You're going to need him to go six or even seven and hopefully strike out north. I mean, maybe a K in inning, but uh, I would say that's a, a pretty unlikely outcome in general. Uh, but you could play both sides here if you land on it, just not in heavy exposures. Patrick Corbin on the mound for the Nats, 6,200. Okay, like, would we like stacking against Corbin, of course, because he gives up power still. 147 innings over the last year plus against righties. 323 average allowed. 389 Wobo with a 286 ISO. 206 ISO, excuse me. Uh, 39% hard contact and 1.8 homers per nine. Heavy barrel rate. We, so we like going after Corbin uh, with righties. Not not so much with lefties. They'll hit for some average still, so you can include those guys in stacks, definitely. Um, but he's got a high ground ball rate against lefties, and despite the hard contact, I mean, we don't really care about that when the ground ball rate is, is this high. It's a low-line drive rate, but against the right side, that's really where we want to attack. However, this season, Corbin has been a little bit better. Um, hasn't gotten totally blown up. He did get Picked apart a little bit in this first start, I believe, against Atlanta. Um, he gave up... Uh, no, that was his first start. It was the start after that against Tampa, where he gave up six runs. Now, he's not going to suppress a lot, but you know he'll still get tagged for three runs pretty much every start. And the strikeout upside is, is not really there. But yeah, at 6,200... Um, eh, I'd, I'd probably just X him because the Cubs against lefties this season have been really, really good. 131 WRC plus, 24% K rate. We're not, we're not terribly worried about that. 9% uh, walk rate, 204 ISO, and a 369 Woba. 
33% hard contact in aggregate, 23% line drive rate. So we're probably going to want to get to some Cub stacks here for sure. Even though Corbin has been a little bit frustrating to stack against this season, he's gone six innings in every start, or five and a third in every start, but his first outing of the year against Atlanta, where he just went three. Um, like I said, the, the strikeout stuff, not there. The, the slider, not good. Not anywhere close to where it was in his Arizona days that got him this big contract with the Nationals. Uh, but and So the entire arsenal is bad here. And we can definitely attack, but uh, I would not be surprised if Corbin kind of survives here for another five and a third or something like that and just gives up two or three runs and you're very frustrated with your Cub stacks. And as a matter of fact, their team total was sitting at about five and a half um, as of five minutes ago and somebody just came in and, and whacked it to the under. So they're sitting right about... Yeah, just over five now. So um, in an interesting little betting market nugget uh, here early in the morning. So um, that doesn't shy us away from getting to the Cubs. We'd still like to stack against Corbin because the arsenal is so bad here. He's going to throw a lot of strikes and pitch to a lot of contact. So um, most of that contact is hard and it is on the barrel. So let's uh, let's go. He's not going to throw it past anybody. It's a 17 and a half percent aggregate strikeout rate. So give me the Cubs for sure. Um, maybe a couple of Nats pieces if you want to play that in tournaments. They have some upside as a secondary stack, and maybe some tie-in as well. I think that's a playable price tag. Okay, Mets and the Tigers. We talked about Verlander. He's coming back. Um, he had a, a muscle strain in his shoulder, I believe. Uh, 10-8 for him. That's I mean, you got to pay for him. This is a Tigers, though. So a couple of things we got to keep in mind with Verlander. Um, well, he's, he's like 93 years old, okay, and... He, over the last several years, like, he was super durable earlier in his career. Then he had TJ, and now he's been hurt for the last couple of seasons. Not that that is having an effect on the numbers, necessarily. Because still, in his last 175 innings, um, like, all of this is still elite tier. So, that's not really a worry. The arsenal is still very good. Three-pitch guy, four-seamer, slider, curveball, slight fly baller. No hard contact, no homers, really. Uh, when when guys get to him, it's usually the home run variety. But he stays off the barrel, has excellent control, doesn't walk people. I mean, this is Verlander. And despite the fact that he's getting up there in age, the numbers over the last year plus, um, I guess this is all of last year since this is, this is his debut this season, are all excellent. So... Um, Nothing really to worry about there. It's lineup construction and getting to him at a full 10-8 price tag and the fact that he only threw 69 pitches in his pre in his last rehab outing. Um, now, could he still stretch? This is the Tigers, all right? The Tigers are terrible. 25% aggregate K rate against righties, 75 WRC+, plus, 118 ISO, sub-30% aggregate hard contact rate with a 278 Woba. It's bad. Top to bottom, it's bad. So they're very attackable for sure, even with a guy in a pitch count that is probably a bit overpriced for the likely amount of work that he's going to get today. Uh, that's the only concern. Could he come out here and just chuck 105? I mean, yeah, sure. It seems pretty unlikely, though. Um I would assume that in most scenarios, he's probably going to be limited to about 80 or 85 pitches here. And that's kind of, like, that's no real bargain at 10-8 um, and, and a full 25% ownership. So that is probably going to keep his ownership down. I think we could probably come in a little bit under the field given the uncertainty in the pitch count, but he could still go six innings and strike out 10 here, uh, no problem, and do it on 85 pitches. So I wouldn't expect a full, unless he is just incredibly efficient here, uh, I wouldn't expect a full 7-plus out of him today. And when we're paying 10-8 for a guy, even a, on a, just, I mean, I guess on a full 9-gamer, it's kind of the, the breaking point where we need to really start to consider uh, our our salary uh, on, the, on the mound. It's not just like, hey, there's short field opportunity costs here that we just kind of have to eat the ownership on a guy and eat the price. It's not really the case when we get into a nine gamer when we've got a lot of arms and we've got some arms that we can get to, I think. So I don't think this is a, a smash, um, 
But this is the Tigers, and this is Verlander, and he can, like I said, he can still go six and and strike out ten, give up maybe a run or two, um, and that's still a very serviceable outing. When on on a slate today, you're probably only going to need twenty to twenty five out of your starting arms anyway. So I think this is perfectly fine to get to. Uh, we like the Mets as well. I'm I'm not dealing with the Eddie Rodriguez as no his. Last couple of starts have been very strong, uh, but he has seen a pretty significant price spike here, and he gets a really bad matchup against Mets. Mets still, even though they've been kind of underwhelming this season, are still only striking out at a 20% clip against lefties, creating at a 107 WRC+, 182 ISO, a little bit of sneaky power here given their kind of underwhelming um, aggregate performance so far. 324 Woba's good. They're going to walk a little bit too. Get the baseball on a line. Not a lot of hard contact. It's mostly in the medium plus category still. But overall, a very solid lineup and a, and a pretty good line in aggregate against lefties. And we got 440 PAs for him now, starting to converge most of this profile here. So, um, I think it's fine getting to the Mets, and I don't really want to get to Eddie, even though really his, I guess his last three starts have been pretty damn good. Eight, seven, five, and two-thirds in his last three with 10Ks, 6Ks, and 5Ks. Uh, so the strikeout stuff in the last couple of matchups seeming to drop off a little bit. It, I mean, but he got Cleveland for 10Ks in eight innings. I mean, that was an elite outing. And he had Baltimore in back-to-back starts there. So it's been very encouraging. However, the most discouraging here is the price bump and, and the matchup change here. Uh, another very difficult spot for him against the Mets. And I'm not interested in, in buying um, a big price spike and chasing good performances uh, into bad matchups in, in most scenarios. So it's a fine median projection for a guy in this range. And if you land on a 7,800 as a deep tournament play, I don't think it's horrific because the upside is there for him to suppress. Overall, however, he's got a, just a 19% aggregate K rate himself, and the you know that eight inning 10K outing against one of the hardest teams to strike out in baseball, uh, that's definitely an outsized performance. So um, I'm not looking to to get too much Eddie. I probably won't X him. Maybe I will. Um, I'm just not interested in this price tag in this particular matchup, given his previous price tag. But the, the four-seamer cutter mix has been fantastic for him. Um, so he can suppress and induce a good bit of soft contact, really, to both sides of the plate. This is an aggregate sample, of course, still from last year and this year, so it doesn't fully reflect how good the four-seamer cutter mix has been. And that's really what's been what has allowed him to survive these last couple, three, four outings against some difficult teams. He got Toronto for a full six innings in his start before that Cleveland game. So um, very encouraging from Eddie, but mostly a, a pitcher anymore and not a DFS pitcher. So uh, not somebody we want to go out of our way to attack, but you can still get to the Mets. They're going to hit for a lot of power. I'd probably prefer just like a three man here, of like a Marte, Frankie Lindor, 4,600. That's a good price for him. Uh, and a Pete Alonso, 5,500. Prices come down a little bit. You can, if you want to get to a, a four or a five man stack, you can mix in a lefty that doesn't really strike out, like a, a Jeff McNeil or Brandon Nimmo. One of those two guys are, are fine. Um, and if you want to make it a full five with somebody cheap down at the bottom of a lineup, like a Mark Hanna, it's okay. Doesn't have a lot of power upside. Or one of the catchers, Tomas Nito or uh, Frankie Alvarez, um, behind the plant. Did I just call him Frankie Alvarez? I think it's Alvarez. <laughs> or Frankie, Frankie something. Um, I'm getting confused. Yeah, it is Alvarez. Uh, in any case, would prefer it's it's him, of course, as opposed to Tomas Nito, uh, if I am going to be playing a catcher. He's 2,300. Nito is 21. So it's kind of whatever. If you want to round out a stack, those are fine plays. They have moved the fences in here a little bit at Tiger Stadium, making it uh, less, um, less, less, constrictive, I, I suppose, against uh, right-handers in particular. Uh, they did move in the left field fence. So um, a little more hitter-friendly, but, I mean, this is still Comerica, and it's still a pretty big ballpark. Uh, about 60 degrees in Detroit today, so should be fine hitting weather if you want to try and get to a couple of Met stacks. I'm not touching the Tigers, but if you want to target Verlander, 
I, I mean, it's not totally out of the, the Tigers are bad. Uh, so you, it'll be a very low probability play, deep tournament stuff only. Um, but you can get to a Verlander here and take some, you know, just like debut shorts on the guy or something like that. I think that's, it's fine, but, uh, certainly not, um, a very high probability play. So mostly just the Mets here, but probably in some pretty limited proportions, I would say, uh, no Eddie. Okay. Uh, Pirates and the Rays. Vince Velasquez, I'm not dealing with this, certainly, against probably the best team in baseball. Uh, 8,100. guy's got a career 5-0 ERA uh, over the last year, plus 426 with a 4.5 expected. Um, the you know, walk numbers are fine, but it's the contact numbers that are super worry, worry, worrying for uh, Vince Velasquez. 11% barrel rate is out of control bad. Hard contact, th- north of 33% to both sides. High ISO. It, a little more attackable, and he has been historically with right-handers. He's a, a fly ball pitcher, and that will generally play pretty well in Tampa. But it's the price tag here. Like, if he were 60 or 6,500, call it, um, I think you could maybe consider a little bit of, uh, you know, just price plays on Velasquez. But at 81, I think this is a totally unplayable price. Uh, against a very dangerous list over here in Tampa. Unfortunately for Tampa, they're all out of control, expensive. 52 for Yandy, 62 for Wander. Randy is 63. Brandon Lau, 5K. Josh Lowe, 4,700. Uh, the playable price tags, Harold and, and Isak Paredes, uh, are at 4 and 3,900 respectively. You can get to a Luke Rayley, uh, a Tyler Walls, or Taylor Walls, excuse me. Um, you can... You can make a stack happen with them. It's uh, but like you gotta make some kind of gulpy decisions price wise, and that'll force you into a cheaper secondary stack and some cheaper arms on the mound. So it, it's possible to make work, and it's gonna keep their ownership down. Um, but like there's a lot of upside here for Tampa, and they're coming in at probably what a in ownership bottom bottom six, bottom eight stack right now um so certainly the lower half in, in ownership there's plenty of other teams you'd probably rather get to but this is vince velasquez and, and we love going after him he gives up hard contact and barrels in bunches and that's not a recipe for success against tampa so uh give me the raise definitely zach eflin though at 9100 i'm also not super interested in this i don't like going after pittsburgh at the moment now they've, they're cooling off and tampa is really kind of um uh, express their dominance, I, I suppose, in this series. Uh, they've taken Pittsburgh apart uh, a couple of times here. So not super interested in in playing Pittsburgh necessarily, um, but I think we can, you know, be pretty confident in, in fading a 21% aggregate carry with a 10% walk rate. 186 ISO, 333 WOBA. These are really good numbers. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, hitting a baseball on a line a little bit with some hard contact, very little soft. So uh, I think this is very playable um, in general. Eflin at 9,100, he just doesn't have a lot of upside himself. So if anything, I'd side with Pittsburgh here. Uh, Price-wise, I'm not super jacked uh, about getting to these guys in Tampa, but they've got a lot of pretty high upside bats here. Of course, Brian Reynolds, uh, we're not worried about power in any park with him from the left side. It definitely is better side. 55, that's playable for sure. You can play some cuts at 4,500. That's okay. Um, Carlos Santana, not so much, but he's 3,400. Unfortunate that you got to play him at sole first base, however. Jack Sawinski, really like this. Kind of a, um, a hard contact and barrel darling. 3,800 in the five holes. A very playable price tag here. So you could you could get to some short stacks of the Pirates maybe uh, and, and take some shorts on Eflin here. Really nothing super impressive in the arsenal. Four-seamer's fine, but he's relying mostly on the sinker change. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, the sinker curveball, um, which is a fine combination in general to keep the baseball down in the strike zone. And he's really good against the right side of the plate. It's the lack of um, excess usage in the changeup that is leading to a lot of power to the left side. 
He's throwing a cutter, which really isn't all that great. Slider's not all that great. He should basically just eliminate those two pitches uh, and go to a four-seamer sinker curveball change mix. So there's not a lot of raw upside for Zach Eflin in the arsenal necessarily. Because the sinker, I mean, we mention this all the time, it's a bad pitch against opposite-handed hitters, and it's not really a swing-and-miss pitch at all. Um, against righties, he will induce the ground balls, which is going to make it a little difficult, like Brian Hayes at 4,900. He's a heavy ground ball hitter uh, and in, with a huge negative split here. Uh, we're not going to go near that, I don't think. But you could play a, a, a better price-adjusted righty like a Connor Joe or something. Um, doesn't strike out a lot and, and has shown good power against really both sides. You want to play Rody Castro mostly against the right side. His left side is his weaker side. Um, you want to play him from the, the right side against a lefty, that is. So not super thrilled there. G1 Bay is a little pricey down in the 8 or the 9 hole. Uh, at 3,700, so not overly excited about getting to anybody outside of the the top, whatever, three guys outside of Brian or Cabrian Hayes. So give me some Reynolds, Kutch, and Sawinski, maybe a Connor Joe and a Carlos Santana if you want to round out a full stack. Uh, but I'm not super thrilled about that. I think it's pretty low upside. You're going to get it totally off the board and completely ignored, which is fine. And at 9,100, and low ownership, I think Eflin is an okay play in that regard. But uh, just in general, not a lot of upside at this price. So I'm not super thrilled about getting to that. If you land on this in, in a couple of teams, I think that's probably okay. But um, I'm not going to go out of my way to force in some Eflin shares here. I think 12% ownership. Like I don't want him in, in, in any more than one of 10 teams here. So uh, I think that's probably a little bit aggressive so far in the early going. So mostly just Tampa here and maybe some short Pittsburgh stacks, but uh, you're going to have to pay for Tampa, and this, that'll keep their ownership down. Uh, okay, let's move on to the Angels in St. Louis. We got Flaherty on the mound for the Cards, Griffin Canning for the Angels, 6,800 for Canning. Um, early going here, 15 and a third, high barrel rate still. This has really always been the problem with Canning. Um, it's fly balls and, and hard contact on the barrel, and that really hasn't changed so far just yet in his first couple of outings this season. 33 hitters against righties, 45.5% hard contact. You know, two homers per nine, whatever, an eight and two-thirds. Super noisy sample, but 233 ISO is a notable number so far. Uh, they're seeing him well and hitting for a lot of power, and it's still in the air. The changeup has been pretty good, but we can't really take a whole lot out of the arsenal values here. In it's such a short sample, um, but this is really like he hasn't changed much in the arsenal because he's really been hurt over the last couple of years. It's it, he's always kind of been a, a four seamer slider change guy, mixing in the curveball for sure. But um, it, this is going to keep him as a fly ball lean. He'll be able to neutralize power to the left side if the changeup continues to be good. But we're not terribly worried about. Um, you know, power getting neutralized over here from the Cardinals because they're really, really balanced in ag in aggregate, right? They've got lefties that hit righties very, very well. So this value that he's eking out of the change so far probably isn't going to persist. Like this ISO at 077, this is going to come up, definitely. Um, you know, the strikeout numbers to both sides hovering at about 24% so far, but he's had a couple of pretty good matchups. Uh, he has seen Oakland... Uh, who else has he seen? I'm checking over here on the other monitor. He saw the Yankees and he saw Washington, right? So two two of three pretty good matchups, and I guess three of three, really, if you consider that the Yankees are, um, well, they're, they're, they're not the early 90s Yankees, right? So Canning on the mound, 6,800. This is a playable price because the Cardinals have been really, really bad. They're 10-1. and one. This is actually the worst record in the National League through a month of baseball. This is shocking that they have been this poor. Uh, it's not due to their offense, however. They're still hitting for average, 250 against righties. They're hitting nearly 280 or something against lefties. Creating still at an average clip, and they're pretty much average all the way around. Elevated hard contact rate in, in aggregate here. So 
the production numbers are going to come up if this hard contact number stays this high. Still walking, of course, with Goldschmidt, Arenado, patient hitters there um, in the middle of the lineup. And they just haven't kind of broken out just yet offensively. Now, will they? I, yeah, I think they will. Uh, it's it's warm in St. Louis today, and they, and they have been dreadful. They lost a, a pretty rough game last night. It's not their offense that's the problem. It's been their pitching staff. So I think we can go after some Cardinal stacks today. They're off the board as well, coming in basically middling in value, in aggregate value, and uh, pretty low in the ownership spectrum. So I think there might be some attackability there going after Canning. He's a fly ball pitcher, as we mentioned, and he's always given up contact on the barrel. So um, I think if there's any susceptibility whatsoever so far in contact to the right side, we can try and go after that and try and capitalize on some of these price tags here. Goldschmidt's still 57. Yeah, you got to pay for him, but everybody else is a very playable price. Lars, 42. Nolan Gorman, 43. Like both of those. Nolan Arenado's 4,500. You very rarely see this price from him. Uh, 44 for Contreras. That hasn't really moved, but he's been great recently, or better recently, I should say. Alec Burleson, 3,200 for him. Dylan Carlson actually hit the bomb off of Otani yesterday. He's at 2,800. We'll see what they want to do down at the bottom of the lineup. Tommy Edmond almost certainly will be in there hitting from both sides. Could be like a Brendan Donovan or um, or something like that. Maybe a Paul DeYoung in the list or giving him a, a little bit more run. So we'll see what they want to do. But you can play pretty much 1-9 to nine from the Cardinals here. And I think this is a, uh, a really off-the-board stack. And one of the few teams that are popping above a five-run total so far. So um, the, market, the betting market certainly agreeing that the Cardinals could be uh, an intriguing stack here, but they're not getting any love in, in DFS yet, and I don't think they're going to. There's too many other teams that are going to garner a lot of ownership here, so I think this is a pretty, it could be a, a pretty off-the-board and equitable stack. Uh, Flaherty on the mound for them. Now, I, I've been stacking against Flaherty literally every day, uh, every time he starts, and I'm going to continue to do it. However, today against the Angels, they've been so poor against righties. 7,600, I think this is a playable price tag for Flaherty. And if you land on, I'm not going to land on him in 17% of my teams, I can tell you that much. But if you want to mix in a couple Flaherty teams at this price, we're kind of hurting for a little bit of mid-range value today. Like you want to play Tyon at 77 against Washington? I mean, eh, it's okay. Um, do you want to play Giolito, who's been really, really up and down against the Twins? I, not really. Um, and that's pretty much it in the 7K range. So if you land on a couple Flaherty's here, I think this is fine. But it, it's, I'm not going to get anywhere close to this ownership number. 14% walk rate still. It hasn't come down. He's still walking people. And he's finally starting to give up a little bit of the production as well. Now, the only reason I think he is playable is because he's throwing this slider so much here, really good value out of this pitch alone. Uh, but it's the, it's the four seamer. That's dreadful. Like he cannot throw this for a strike and he doesn't throw any other fastball with any like mega regularity. Like he should move all of this, usage over to the cutter and that would be valuable for him um it would help him induce a lot of soft contact the k stuff is not really there in aggregate it's been there in a couple of starts he got the dodgers for seven and four and two thirds he got seattle for nine and six so he's hovering at a roughly a k an inning here got the rockies at coors for six and five and a third um so he's hovering with a little bit of sneaky K value so far. It's because of the really good slider value so far. But um, so I think that, that he's playable uh, against the Angels. They've been pretty bad overall against righties. 23% K rate, neutral in every other metric. Hitting the ball hard, though, just like the Cardinals here. So um, a little worrisome. They'll still walk. That's elevated by Otani and Trout, of course. But nothing terribly concerning here about the Angels. That said, this is still Flaherty, and he's still walking people. He still can't throw strike one. He's got a bad fastball and no changeup. So I'm still going to stack against that 
and and I'm waiting for a huge explosion. So uh, give me just offense in this game. I'm not super thrilled about anything. I mean, price tag wise, yeah, you can you can mix in a couple of canning teams. You can mix in a couple of Flaherty teams. Um, you know, given this ownership delta, I'd rather play canning. He's 800 cheaper, and he's you know a tenth of the ownership. Um, but give me offense mostly. You're going to get offense totally off the board in this game, and I think this is a decent tournament target. Okay, Minnesota and the White Sox. Pablo on the mound at 9,900. Yikes. Um, this is probably where he should have been priced at the early part of the season. Uh, unfortunately, now we're getting a huge price spike. And uh, are the White Sox heating up a little bit? I don't know. They're they're bad, too. They've been just as bad as the Cardinals. Um, not the worst team in the AL, but you know, pretty damn bad themselves. 18% ownership. I think this is fine to get to. Uh, White Sox overall have been underwhelming. Uh, we did see the Twins get to cease yesterday. That's because he walked people. Like he, he once again walked four guys, and and gives up hard contact. You know, on on a barrel sometimes. So, um, Giolito is going to do the same thing here. And of these guys on the mound, I would yeah yeah I don't know. I'd probably prefer from a price perspective getting to Giolito. Obviously, he's twenty five hundred cheaper. It's kind of a no brainer. Um, he is coming in a, a little bit more popular, and this makes me a kind of uh, kind of worried here. This Arsenal is still not very good. He's still on the barrel a little bit to the right side with some hard contact. 219 ISO in aggregate over his last 200 innings, 108 and a third against righties. 308 average is a huge number. 383 WOBA. It's still really big, and the K stuff is starting to show up and 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 kind of normalize a little bit for Giolito. In his first, what, five, six starts this year, six, three, seven, seven, five, six. And he's going deeper into games, five, four innings in kind of a clunker against Pittsburgh where he really got torn apart, six, six, seven, and six and two thirds. So the suppression is starting to normalize and flatten out a little bit. He's starting to figure it out. And over his last four starts, he's had three real serviceable outings. And he's at a very playable price tag. So I think this is attackable here going after the twins um they can get really balanced lefty righty and they can make it difficult on him he's better against lefties and his problems have been against righties and getting on the barrel with a bad four seamer here but the change is bad as well so this is going to um this power number is going to come up if the changeup continues to provide such negative value here but he's basically just a three-pitch guy good thing he's not throwing a curveball because hugely negative value here but still a fly ball pitcher that's going to get on the barrel a little bit. At least it's certainly two same-handed hitters. So uh, we can target some of these righties if you want and get to uh, like a Buxton. That's uh, that's that's fine. He's up to 5,600 now. It's, it's okay. Carlos Correa is still 47. Still okay. Georgie Polanco 48. Yeah, it's a little expensive. He was like 49 yesterday. It's a, it probably a bit aggressive for him. But Max Kepler makes it a little bit cheaper, 37 if you want to get there, 34 for Trevor Larnick. He's probably going to strike out a lot in this matchup, so not super thrilled with that. But uh, Josie Miranda, 34, probably not going to strike out a, a, a ton there and has a little bit of pop. So if you want to get to a, a decently balanced stack here for the Twins, I think this is an okay sort of leverage spot against what's likely to be pretty high ownership. Again, we're kind of starving for some mid-range plays and targeting Giolito, I think you can do that with the Twins. Uh, do I want to go after Pablo with the White Sox? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't like this price tag here at 9,900 though. I think the ownership is fine. Median projection seems fine so far. Uh, I like the pitch mix now that Pablo's brought in the sweeper, but he has really always been more susceptible uh, to lefties here. In aggregate, I know the power number is whatever, 1% higher to to the right side. Uh, but it's the lack of raw whiff stuff that he has against lefties that's really worrisome. He's got a 30% K rate against the right side. which And generally, we want to target that on the mound uh, with you know when we get very righty-heavy lineups over here. And we certainly have that in the Sox. Tim Anderson is back. So he's not going to strike out a lot, but he'll he's still got a little bit of whiff in him. And once again, we we got a 30% K rate here for Pablo. Uh, ben Intendi's not going to strike out in his from the left side, so that's a playable 3300 if you want to get there. 
but they don't have a lot of high upside left-handers here that can really make it difficult on Pablo. So I think, I I mean, fundamentally, I, I definitely side with Pablo here. But Tim Anderson, as we've seen over the last couple of games, he, he makes this lineup tick. And when he is seeing the baseball at the top and making things dip, difficult for starters, working counts, getting on base, stealing bases, uh, that elevates pitch counts. And, and it makes things difficult getting to a guy like Benintendi that doesn't strike out at the in the two. Um, Eloy is heated up a little bit. Luis Robert, he's down at a playable 4,300 price tag now. So you could play some of the White Sox here in very deep tournament stacks. Um, they're coming in at similar ownership to like the Cardinals and similar values to the Cardinals as well. So uh, you could play an off-the-board stack and take some shorts on Pablo at 9,900. Fundamentally, I would still side with Pablo and and like to get to this. I really like this pitch mix with the sweeper that he's brought in. And I, I think this is okay to target, but I'm really not thrilled about the price. Um, I, I don't know. I'm kind of lukewarm on this. I'll probably land somewhere about with the field, maybe 15% of my teams with Pablo or something like that. Not totally sure, but that's mostly where I'd like to get um, probably mostly pitching here. But if you want to get to a twin stack or so and leverage against some of this Giolito ownership, uh, I think that's a fine play as well. Okay, Baltimore and Kansas City. 8,300 on the mound for Grayson Rodriguez. 15% ownership uh, against the Royals. Yeah, sign me up. Let's go. Um, I love this kid. This changeup is elite. This is a fantastic pitch. So he's really going to be able to neutralize any of the lefties that the Royals are going to throw at him. Now, Vinny is an incredible hitter, and this kid has immense upside. You could play him against probably everybody in baseball at this point. He's still at a playable 3,600. Bobby Witt in this particular matchup I'm not super thrilled with um, at 4,900. Same thing with Salvi behind the plate. You could play him at 4,300. It's a good price-adjusted play. Um, since Salvi's been upwards of 5K most of the season, 38 for MJ is a fine price. Eddie Oliveris right in the middle of the lineup at 27 makes the 49 for Bobby Witt a little bit more palatable as well. But I don't want to stack against Grayson Rodriguez here. Give me a lot of, of this 8,300 price tag. I think the ownership here is probably a bit too low for the upside that he offers. Also one of the top pitching prospects in baseball for the last several seasons, similar to like a, a Hunter Brown, um, just high, high upside here. Fine four-seamer so far, fine cutter usage so far. Uh, slider leaving a little bit on the table in terms of value. Still a short, short-ish short sample. It's 24 and a third. Um, curveball, I, I don't want to see him throw this pitch like pretty much ever. He's hanging it. Um, maybe this is just short sample noise. I doubt it, though. That's kind of hard to see that much negative value. So it, it's a good four-pitch mix in... Maybe four and a half if he ekes more value out of the curveball here. But uh, overall, everything is fine. It's it's some walks that he's had a little bit of trouble with so far. But high ground ball rate, excellent whiff stuff, and the Royals are bad. So 25% K rate against righties for them this season. 68 WRC plus, 127 ISO. And most of the, the bounce in these numbers over the last, um, I guess, day, you know, came, came yesterday against... Uh, well, for in the last two days against Tyler Wells and Kyle Gibson. So um, give me all of Grayson Rodriguez here. I really like this spot a lot, and I really dig the lower ownership. It's probably going to spike a little bit. He'll come in. I'd, I'd be shocked if he came in this low. But uh, this is a very good kind of low 8K play that we can get to. Uh, I think is very valuable here. Uh, Jordan Lyles on the mound, 6,600. This is a playable price tag for him as well. We saw what Zach Rinke did to the Orioles yesterday. And Jordan Lyles is a similar kind of pitcher. Doesn't have overwhelming stuff. Didn't really have any good stuff. But he's got five full pitches that he can use to navigate. And he's not throwing very hard. But he can locate and he will throw strikes. Um, unfortunately for him, it's just a lot of contact a lot of the time. We want to get to him mostly with righties. We can get to him with, uh, excuse me, mostly with lefties. We can get to him with righties as well. Lefty's hitting for a 231 ISO, 20% K rate, 33% hard contact, 1.8 homers per nine. High barrel rate, 
against Jordan Lyles, and that's really the big difference between he and Granky. Granky stays off the barrel, doesn't have any upside whatsoever. K rates are sim- similar, low swinging strike, low CSW anymore for these guys. But Jordan Lyles a bit more on the barrel, so we can attack that a little more readily than we could have yesterday with Granky, even though you know Granky's Granky. So we can get to some Baltimore definitely, and we're seeing it once again an elevated total for them. Um, I did. I think both sides are playable here. This is a playable price for Jordan Lyles. Not my favorite. I'm not going to go out of my way to target this, but there's more value than one percent ownership. I think this is an exploitable number here. Median projection is always going to come in low for Lyles, but he has 18 or 20 in the tank here. He could go five innings, strike out five. He can go six innings, strike out five, or six or something, and that warrants a little bit more ownership than just 1% here. So I think this is, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not a huge edge, but if you land on 6,600 and you really like your team otherwise, I think it's a playable price tag for Lyles. But give Give me some Baltimore for sure. I like Cedric. 59 I don't like for him, but um, you can play 52 for Rutch. That's probably the uh, the bottom end of his, his price range. I'd be pretty surprised if you see him less than 5K pretty much all season. Mountcastle still playable at 4,800. 43 for Santander, also still playable. Gunner probably back in the lineup today. Just got a day off yesterday against Granky, I think. Um, so that was kind of frustrating, but 3,700 for him in, in the middle of the lineup, also still playable. So you can get to some cheaper guys down at the bottom and some in the middle here that make the, the top three guys, really Cedric Rutch and Malcast a little bit more playable. Uh, we'll see who they have behind the plate today. Um, whether they'll just DH Rutch and, and give Brian McCann some run against a righty. Uh, we'll see. Um, but he's very cheap still as well so you can you can target some Lyles uh, and target some Baltimore Baltimore is one of the more popular teams of course today so you can get to them but I think both sides are playable here but give me all of the Grayson Rodriguez and really none of the Royals outside of like a Vinny uh, maybe an MJ or something or at a price adjusted Salvi but outside of that um, I don't want to deal with any of these lefties this changeup is an elite pitch okay Wade Miley on the mound at Coors Field um for the Brewers against the Rockies in the final game of their series. 7,200 for Miley. I'm not doing it. Um, the Rockies are not great, but they, I mean, they've they been a little bit better over the last uh, week or so. Um, and this is Wade Miley at Coors Field. This is a 17% K rate. No, thank you. 79% contact. Uh, we're just not doing it. He could suppress, yeah, and he could surprise everybody. Is there more value on him than 2% ownership? Uh, yeah, maybe at this at this price tag, could he pop for 18 points? Sure, um, but I'm I'm still I'm going after him. Give me the Rockies, definitely. They can platoon, and some of these younger hitters, notably an Ezek Zeke Tovar, Alan Treo, getting regular at bats now for these guys down at the bottom of the lineup. They've they're starting to come into their own a little bit, showing a little bit of power, and Zeke Tovar is playing every day for these guys. And he is a, a consensus top 25 prospect in baseball. So they're just going to let this kid run, and they're going to let him learn. He's 21 years old at the major league level. So um, both he and Alan Treo getting a lot of a lot of ABs in the middle infield. Grichik is back and healthy. Swing looks good. And he's 3,500 at Coors Field. Sign me up. Elias Diaz, 39. He's very playable as well. He's been one of the best hitters for them. Probably up there with uh, Chris Bryant in terms of uh, value and consistency. CJ Crone, 49. That's playable. Chris Bryant down to 52 from 59 yesterday. Everybody everybody in the lineup here outside of Ryan McMahon at 4,800 got a price drop from yesterday. So uh, give me the Rockies once again. And I think catching a dollar thirty on them in the betting markets would be an okay play were it not for Connor Siebold on the mound for them. Uh, this is just going to be a spot start. He's been coming out of the bullpen for him. Maybe get four at- innings or so out of him, but um, the Arsenal is not impressive, at least for a, a bullpen arm. He throws a, kind of a surprising number of strikes here, but overall not impressive. He's not going to throw it by people necessarily. He's still going to give up a lot of power and 
and he'll get on the barrel for sure. So um, does induce a good bit of soft in this short sample here, inducing at a full 22% clip to the lefties, which is kind of surprising because the changeup really not good value here, um, mostly because of a slider. But overall, I mean, he's, he's fly ball pitcher in a day game at Coors Field, uh, and it's warm, 75 degrees at, at Coors today. So give me uh, give me the Brewers once again, and market fully agrees there coming in at heavy, heavy ownership. You're going to see north of 20% on pretty much every one of these guys. Um, so we'll see what they do. It is one of the later games on the slate here. So keep an eye out for that and what they do with the, the lineup shenanigans. But uh, give me everybody, righties, lefties, I don't really care. They're all at um, very playable price tags and all still too cheap. Even, I mean, the only, like, reasonable price tag here for uh, for all these guys is Willie Adamas at 6000 I mean, Yelich is playable at 54 here, uh, even though he's, you know, washed up Christian Yelich. Contreras behind the plate, 47, eh, kind of make some decisions there, I think, but everybody else is uh, fourth K or, or cheaper. Um, so give me, give me all of the offense in this game for sure. Uh, I think we're going to want to, uh, to go after Coors Field today. Uh, even though the Brewers have been very disappointing in this series, um, that is unlikely to change today or unlikely to persist today, I should say. Okay. Seattle and Oakland, George Kirby on the mound for the Mariners. He gets the athletics. Kirby has been really good. 8800 for him. Uh, very playable price tag. I would probably, at this ownership level, uh, come in... I certainly wouldn't come in over, I don't think. I'd rather come in way over on Grayson Rodriguez. Um, but this is fine. It, it, it It's a workable arsenal for him so far. He's throwing a hell of a lot of strikes. Still pitching to a, a bit too much contact for me. Given the the high K rate here, it's mostly the lefties where the Ks are coming from. But if he keeps throwing this change up at a full eight ten percent of the arsenal, uh, this these lefty suppression numbers are going to come up. Now, everything looks good so far in in a pretty respectable sample. He's still staying down in the strike zone a little bit to the right side. A buck forty ground ball to fly ball there. It's not overly susceptible to barrel contact. Um, anything like that. So this is a fine arsenal so far, but he's got to he's got to figure out the real negative slider and change up values here. Uh, otherwise, like these these whiffs against righties are going to stay down at 21%, probably decrease from there. And the K rate to lefties at 26%, if the change up is still bad, is still gonna is gonna be uh, pretty awful. Also, however, we've seen with guys like Joe Ryan who have just elite four-seamers, extreme value, plus value on those pitches, uh, it allows them to work to maybe some suboptimal or, or league average secondary pitches, like a, a bad slider or a bad changeup or something like that. If you're getting ahead in counts, throwing 68% strike one and not walking anybody, then you put yourself in equitable, sp equitable spots and you can navigate and you can throw pitches in the counts that you want to throw them in. Um, and you don't allow hitters to dictate counts. So this is it's still a very equitable arsenal for Kirby so far. The price tag is a little elevated. I think that's probably where he should be. I'm not sure we can eke out a hell of a lot of value out of this number. And definitely not out of the 35% ownership here. So I'd rather come in under. I mean, he did throw a complete game with 7Ks against the Phillies. So... Perhaps a bit outsized of a performance there. He does get Oakland now, who is bad, right? Um, so I'm not totally jacked about going after 8,800 here and and 35% ownership. I'd rather come in a little bit under at and go get some Grayson at 83 and half the ownership. So give me that instead. But not like I'm gonna I'm gonna X Kirby out of the pool or anything. He's gonna pop really hard in in the in your your builds because the projection is so high so uh give me that definitely it, it's going to be very hard to get grayson himself because i mean the projection is nearly three points higher here for kirby so there's nothing wrong um but i yeah we can go after oakland it's just a balancing line of construction with 
ownership here at a full 35 and 40%. It's probably going to steam a little bit. Uh, Drew Rosinski on the mound. Played him in his first start against the Reds. That did not go very well. Uh, I'm probably going to consider playing him a, a little bit again today. Maybe with the field here. Uh, does he have 17 point, 18 point upset? Yeah, I think he does. And at 5,000, that's a pretty equitable start, I think. Uh, I'm still convinced that this Arsenal can play back at the major league level. The Reds can be a little bit sticky sometimes, even though they strike out a lot. They they do still make a good bit of contact, and that's really what got Rosinski into trouble in his debut start um, for this season. I'm I'm probably still going to go back to this a little bit. However, Seattle, I'm much more terrified <laughs> today of, of going back to this. Uh, number one, because he got a thousand dollar price bump. Number two, because Seattle is a overall better lineup than Cincinnati, even though they haven't quite performed. Um, basically a similar level to Cincinnati. 98 WRC plus for the Mariners so far. 26% K rate. Higher walk rate, 9%. And 305 Woba. All these numbers are, are pretty average so far. And sure enough, that's how we get to a, a an average WRC plus. Now, if Rosinski is going to pitch to a bit more contact, as he's probably going to do uh, in the bigs, then, yeah, give me some Mariner stacks, but 5000 is a playable price, and if we want to get up to some Verlander or something, then we might need, and, and an expensive stack like Coors or whatever, we might need somebody kind of off the board down here like a Rosinski, and he can make this happen. Um, there's, there's, like I said, 15, 18-point upside here for Rosinski. Probably not all that probable, uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't get a full 15% of the guy or anything, I don't think. Um, but I think, you know, twice the field here at 10%, I think that's an okay play if you need it. I wouldn't go out of my way to force it in necessarily, but if you land on that much, I would probably be okay with it. I think at this price tag, uh, it makes a lot of things work. So I think it's fine to be playing with some Rosinski here. We'll see how the arsenal and, um, and the numbers flesh out as he gets more work, but... A dangerous spot, definitely. And if you want to just stack the Mariners against him, yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's fine, too. Julio at 58 is fine. Kelnick at 44. like this price for him still. Uh, he's in the 2 or the 3, whatever they're going to do with him. Ty France at 4,000. Yep, I'm going to go right back to it. Cal Raleigh should be in there today. 41. We really like him from the left side of the plate. Gino hit a walk-off bomb last night, or a, what amounted to one in the top of the 10th inning. Uh, 3,600 now for him. Uh, that's playable, even though he's been dreadful all season. Tay Oscar, 3,900. He's been really, really bad. Uh, but he has two homer upside literally every day. So got to be careful of, of fading him and Mariner stacks if you do that. Taylor Trammell make it cheap. J.P. Crawford, Colton Wong down at the bottom of the lineup. So you could play some Mariners for sure if you want to get after them. They'll be one of the more popular teams today as well up there with Milwaukee and Baltimore and probably the Cubs too. So you're going to have to figure out how to make ownership work. But I think getting to correlated teams with Kirby and the Mariners, that's fine. If you want to take some Oakland uh, Rosinski over here, I, th I think that's okay too. I'm pretty much off of of Oakland uh, on a full slate like this. I'm not super interested there. But um, very off-the-board stack, if you want to target a Kirby and maybe some some regression in that change-up value, then yeah, sure, go ahead. I think it's, it's okay uh, if you want to play like a stone minimum J.J. Blade or a Brent Rooker or somebody. any Asterio Ruiz at the top of the lineup, he's been great. That's fine. Okay, last game of the day here, Atlanta and Miami. Uh, Dylan Dodd on the mound, this is the guy I was referring to. Would, the DK just doesn't have him in the player pool. He's made two starts this season. Got picked apart pretty good. No real whiff stuff. Um, and how I have the sheet built here, I don't have his seasonal numbers coming in because I, I pull in whether or not they are in the DK player pool. So um, nothing really to speak of. He projects for about a 20% K rate at the bigs, and he's a lefty uh, with kind of underwhelming stuff. Um, no real velo and and three pitches. So it's, it's just kind of a meh arsenal, um, and you can't play him anyway. Do we want to target him? Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. If you want to get to some off-the-board Miami stacks, I think this is 
this is okay. They're going to pop in a little bit in value for you here today. If they lead off somebody like a John Birdie at 3K, yeah, give me a lot of that. Uh, I think that's very valuable. Um, are they going to go with their very low strikeout lineup up at the top, like a, a Birdie, Segura, Yuli Gurriel, um, Luis Arise? Are they going to give him run against Dodd today? Maybe. Uh, he hits lefties and righties just fine. Obviously, Georgie Zolaire has the most power for the Marlins, so you can get to them. They haven't been on a main slate here in a long time, so we haven't talked a lot about the Marlins recently, but you can play these guys. They're very playable prices. Nick Fortes in the middle of the lineup, cheap catcher piece, has some pop at uh, 2600 You can absolutely get there. Garrett Hampson hasn't been a total zero, uh, as he pretty much was every day when he was at Coors Field. Um, 2200 he's... Seeing the baseball a little bit more comfortable as he's, as he's getting regular ABs. There was always upside for him uh, if he got very regular ABs. And once again, he's on a bad team. But he's, what, in his fourth year in the bigs now? And maybe a change of scenery is just all he needed. So he's been okay. And he's at 2200 if you want to run a, a wraparound Marlins or something like that. Uh, popping a little bit in the value score and... Not so much in the ownership. So another one of these off-the-board sacks that you can get to and target some Dylan Dodd over here. Um, Jesus Luzardo, I love this, at uh, 8,600. Market really likes it as well. So this is what's keeping Grayson Rodriguez's ownership down. And I'm, like, it. I understand, <laughs> you know. Uh, Jesus Luzardo, he's got the highest swinging strike rate on the day at 14% here. CSW at 31%. And we don't want to go after... Atlanta with lefties usually because look at these numbers 139 WRC plus yeah 24% K rate okay but a 234 ISO 47% hard contact rate against lefties 386 WOBA hitting for a 299 average as a team 400 PAs sure but starting to converge a little bit here and th these are elite numbers so if you want to stack the Braves against any lefty in baseball it, it doesn't matter go ahead I'm probably going to side with Jesus Luzardo. I'm not super crazy about the ownership, elevating a little bit. 8600 I think the price tag's fine, and the upside is absolutely there because he's got K stuff to both sides of the plate, 32% to lefties, 29% to righties. We'll give up a little bit of hard contact on the barrel to the right side, but we're not worried about him throwing strikes, putting people on base for free, anything like that. He has gotten roughed up in, in his last couple of starts, Um so I'm kind of looking for a little bit of a bounce here for Luzardo. And high median projection so far. This is, once again, with Kirby and uh, and Luzardo here with higher projections than Rodriguez. It's what's going to make it difficult to get to him in a far better matchup. But I, So in that regard, I think you could consider coming in underweight on Jesus Luzardo here, but the projections for these two guys in the 85 to 8,800 range uh, are going to make it difficult to not get a lot of them if you're just scripting a bunch of teams. So um, I like it. I, there's nothing wrong here. I'm not worried about the arsenal. Slider is, is marginal league average value here so far. And I'm okay with that, but the changeup is an elite pitch and... The release point with the four seamer and the changeup is is elite tier. So that's what makes it so good, and what's which allows him to get so much swing and miss on the pitch. So um, I like this. I think he can neutralize a lot of the very high upside right handers from from the Braves over here. If you want to stack them, yeah, I mean, go ahead. They're the probably the highest raw upside outside of Tampa uh, team on the slate in aggregate. We saw yesterday on a short slate, they put up 15 runs or whatever. I mean, they just do it every day. Um, probably the second or third best team in baseball are the Braves. So if you want to stack them, yeah, you can play them literally every single day against everybody. But I think I'd side with Luzardo in most instances here, and I'll probably come in somewhere near the field. I'm not crazy about eating a lot of ownership on a guy against the Braves, certainly a lefty. Uh, so I'll probably come in under because I like Grayson so much, but... I think this is very playable, and I, I don't see anything that is worrisome. Uh, all of the numbers, suppression and strike throwing, um, control, is everything is great. And this is the Luzardo that we were waiting for. So 
Um, he's really taken that next step this season. I guess last season, too. And, yeah, I'm stoked to play the guy pretty much every outing. I'm not as stoked to play him today, of course, but uh, yeah, give me some, give me some Luzardo for sure. Maybe a little bit of the Marlins against Dylan Dodd, uh, and of course none of him because uh, well he's not in the player pool. Uh, okay, so I think that is it for the main slate breakdown. Um, once again, went about an hour here, so sorry about that. But uh, quickly, let's go over stacks. Give me the Cubs definitely. Maybe, maybe, maybe get to some value Washington pieces. Probably not, though. Um, less enthused about arms on the mound here. I guess some tie-on if you land on it. Uh, Mets, sure. Kind of down the list a little bit. I, I still respect Eduardo here um, a little. Verlander, definitely. It's just being able to make it work. And we, do have, we might have pitch count concerns there. So mostly uh, just pitching here. Um, from Verlander, and mostly, I guess, just the Mets, I suppose. Just offense here, I think. Uh, Pittsburgh and Tampa, maybe a short Pittsburgh stack. Mostly Tampa. I want to target Vince Velasquez. Angels, St. Louis, uh, just exclusively offense here. Maybe some Flaherty if you land on it, but, like, ugh, I'd rather find, I'd rather find another, whatever, 700 to get to Rodriguez. Um... Minnesota and the White Sox. If you want to take some stacks here, I think this is okay. Targeting variance in Giolito and targeting a high price tag in Pablo Lopez. I think it's all right, but mostly Pablo. And I'll have some Giolito as well, I think. Baltimore and Kansas City. Yeah, give me some Baltimore and give me all of the Grayson Rodriguez. Maybe a couple Jordan Lyles teams. You can suppress at this price tag. Milwaukee and Colorado offense only, of course. Seattle and Oakland. I like Seattle. Uh, we'll probably have a couple of price-adjusted Drew Rosinski teams. And Atlanta, yeah, if you want to target Luzardo, I'm not super thrilled about it, but they have very high upside. couple Miami, off-the-board Miami stacks. I think this is reasonable targeting Dylan Dodd. Okay, so that is it for the breakdown of the main, once again, just day baseball today. Um, so good luck to everybody. Keep an eye out for the projection and ownership updates. Things are going to change here as we get more of the models to, to wake up coming into lock. So good luck. Uh, we'll catch you guys tomorrow for a big Friday slate.